Good evening. I'm Ian Wardropper, director of the Frick Collection. And pleased to invite you to, to welcome you to um, the art and life of Luigi Valadier, a conversation between Alvar Gonzalez Palacios and Xavier Salomon. This is the first day of the public opening of the exhibition, Luigi Valadier's Splendor in 18th Century Rome. So I'm delighted to introduce the two responsible for the exhibition and accompanying book. Or as will be explained, really the other way around, the exhibition accompanying the book. In the bigger picture, this important show is part of a greater commitment over the past 15 years to the decorative arts at the Frick, which includes the creation of an endowed creator, uh, curatorship for decorative arts occupied by Charlotte Vignon, publications and exhibitions. Over the last six years, we've mounted three exhibitions devoted to major designers and craftsmen who merit more study and greater recognition. These are uh, on the German Johann Christian Neuber, the Frenchman Pierre Gutier, and now the Italian Luigi Valadier. This project has produced the first comprehensive monograph on Valadier and the first exhibition in the United States on him. There is no better art historian to explain Valadier than Alvar Gonzalez Palacios. In fact, it is impossible to imagine the field of historical study of Italian Baroque and neoclassical decorative arts without him. He has worked on such major figures as Pietro Pifetti, Filippo uh, Tagliolini, Giovanni Battista Peronesi, and uh, most significantly, Luigi Valadier, who has been the subject of his scholarship for nearly 50 years. Fundamental collection catalogs of decorative arts at the Louvre, at Prado, the Quirinal, and the Vatican have been published under his supervision. Alvar has also had an extraordinary life, having been born in Cuba, then educated and teaching in Europe while living in Florence, Milan, Paris, and Rome, a life which he has chronicled in two memoirs. Xavier Salomon's career also spans various countries, born in Rome, educated at the graduate level in England, and a career there uh, and in the United States. He has worked as curator at the Dulwich Picture Gallery, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and now as Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator at the Frick Collection, where he began as a Mellon Fellow some 14 years ago. He's written numerous publications, especially on Renaissance and Baroque paintings, uh, and has done many exhibitions, most recently Canova's George Washington, uh, and in concert with Alvar, organized the present exhibition on Luigi Valadier. I look forward to what we will learn from the conversation of these two art historians, uh, and just want to remind you that the exhibition is open uh, for half an hour after this lecture is over, and to ask you to silence your cell phones. Now I'm gonna ask uh, Alvar and Xavier to uh, come on the stage. Good evening. Can you hear me? Does it, does it work? Um, so welcome to this conversation about Luigi Valadier about the exhibition. Uh, it's sort of strange and, and, and interesting for us to sort of talk about this after almost five years of talking about it between the two of us and sort of preparing it and, and thinking about the selection of objects and the, um, the types of objects, the, the, the way in which we were gonna display these and, and now sort of seeing it ready to go um, in the rooms. But I wanna start from the beginning and really ask Alvar how how you became interested in Valadier. I mean, in decorative arts, Italian decorative arts more generally, but how did Luigi Valadier come into your life at a point where very few people knew who Luigi Valadier was? It all started out of hunger <laughs> because I was starving at the beginning of the Cuban Revolution in Florence, and I understood that I wasn't going to earn my life talking about Spinello Aretino or Lorenzo Monaco, which were the things that I was studying then in, under Roberto Longhi. So one day came to the house of the master, uh, 
Dino Fabri, who was a, a quite a knowledgeable, agreeable fellow who had been, in a way, a pupil of Longy many years before. And he said, you better do something else because otherwise you'll get, you have to go very soon to a hospital. You're too thin. I wish I could say the same today. But <laughs> that, that is as it was. So I, he asked me, would you come to Milan now and then and perhaps you could start forming an archive for us. And so uh, I started doing this, and I realized myself that I didn't know anything about the decorative arts, because really it, Italian art history was not interested at all in this. They were there, and there were two bibliographies, one which were the sources of art history, and then collectors, which were usually mediocre dealers or all blue-haired ladies who couldn't care less and they wanted to have a picture the size of their divan and a divan the size of their picture. And that was the main source of it all. So I decided, looking at all these museums, and what I did was going to the... I, I came to know a lot of people this way because I had to convince people that it, we would produce the photos they will share, no, they will get nothing for the, but, but a copy of the photo. And in those days, it didn't occur to anybody that they could be, be, become rich making pictures and selling them. So I got to know all the people in Munich, in Berlin, in, in my own native or half native Spain, France, etc., etc. And it soon occurred to me that there was an empty niche in Italian studies. So why didn't I do that? and perhaps I could earn a life that way, and I did. <laughs> and so it happened slowly, and I, I started looking at things. I didn't know very, very well what they were, but I thought that, that, that they were interesting and beautiful. And slowly, um, I got to know a little bit more. Then there was a flood in Florence when I was studying. So since the things were so horrid, I, I thought I wasn't going to go and look at pictures destroyed and things like that. So passing through the Uffizi, uh, you know, the middle part of the, of the, of, of the arcades, uh, I saw a, a poor man who was the director of the archives, which, as you know, were in the Uffizi, as you don't know, because there's no reason why you should know it. They were then in the Uffizi, so they got immediately flooded. That's where the Arno passes, it went up, and all the things. So this man called me and said, you must help me. Can you find people of your age? And I did. I, I went at the corner, I got 40 young men who came and helped, and do, did, did do, do this for a number of days, and we got these huge packages of, of, of documents, but it was something terrifying cover of mud and of dirty oil, etc., etc. So uh, he said to me, but I haven't seen you in the archives ever. Come here, you may find something that interests you. As a matter of fact, it wasn't a la mode then to go to learn about things in the archives. So I went there after a while, and, and he helped me, and I started to find documentations at random. I already knew Pierre Verle in France, and he had told me, when you go to an, an archive, you will not find what you're looking for, but you will find other things. Make a note. And I did make it, many notes. So about 40 years later, I suddenly remembered somebody who had brought me a very strange table with strange and complicated coat of arms in ivory and ebony, and I saw it, remember the description of that object, which I had read before. It was like a sort of transfer. And then I went, I was in, 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 in the seashore in the in month of August. I went to Florence, to Rome, where I live. I'm sorry, I always say Florence after, because I saw it there. Gaga. I, I took a book out, and there it was. And it was a description I knew well because it was a table that was in the house, in the room where Vittoria de la Rover, from Urbino, the last heiress of Urbino. That's what there is, the Venus of Urbino by Titian, etc. Et and they were in Florence. So that was the reason why it was there. It had been there. 
And then I identified the thing immediately. I knew who, who made it. So it is, it's a complications of things that how, when did I first hear about, about Balladier? I don't really know. I just happened to read about him. And then in 1972, uh, there, I had been already in an exhibition with great old men who helped me. Uh, I am an old man now, I'm rather nasty, but I, I help the young because somebody who was old and nasty also helped in those days. People like Bulgaria or Petrangelo, famous names, and they were nice to me. And so I found things about Valerie. So I started looking for more and more and more, and I never thought that I was going to make an exhibition, the other part of the ocean. But it so happens, I came here. Why did you ask me to do this exhibition? <laughs> I think because I gave a lecture here about the sales, which you will see the most beautiful one of them all here. And so slowly, it just grew and sick of sound. It, it, it happens and things happen because they have to happen. That's all, there are no explanations. It's just a question of chance. But I'm happy I've done it. Well, actually, I can tell you why, why I asked you. Um, I, Alvar curated the first major Valadier exhibition in 97, I think yeah. it was, at Villa yes, Medici yes, yes, yes. in Rome. I was in my last year at school and I went to see that exhibition. And I remember it, I mean, I still have the catalog and I remember the exhibition very well. It was a hugely impressive show for someone, again, I didn't know anything about decorative arts. I knew I was gonna study art history, but I was thinking about paintings. And I went to see the exhibition and thought it was absolutely marvelous. And that's how, as far as I can remember, the first time that Valadier- You've never told me that. Well, there you go. <laughs> I'm telling you now. Uh, that's, you know, that's the first time I think I heard of Valadier. If you grow up in Rome, anyone who knows about Valadier thinks of the Casina Valadier, which is a rather horrid restaurant now, um, that actually has nothing to do with our Valadier, it's to do with the sun. But that, that's probably the first time anyone hears the name growing up in Rome. Um, so I was glad to know that it wasn't just a bad restaurant, but it was also a great artist. And, um, and then when I was here at the Frick, very early on, um, talking to Charlotte Vignon, who's our curator of decorative arts, she introduced me to someone else who I knew very little about, which is Pierre Gutierre, and she was w beginning to work on her wonderful exhibition when I first arrived here. And as she told me about that project, I kept thinking, well, you know, we did Neuburg, we've done, we're doing Gutierre, what else can we do? And, and obviously Valadier was the key, the key name that came into my mind, and I thought it's the obvious progression in terms of focusing on people who worked around the same time but in very different countries. So talking about the Villa Medici show, what, what do you think is the difference between that show and this show, apart from the geographical difference, obviously, between Rome and New York? Well, we know more, and uh, we have seen more documents, we have discovered more objects, and in a way, it's a much more concentrated show. The other one, actually, the Villa Medici show was very beautiful, but it's not the place for it. It was in, in staircases, and so you, the, the space was perhaps too big. And this is a sort of palatial, but concentrated around a table or objects which are not for great spaces. So, uh, in a way, I think this is more and more important. I wish it were bigger, of <coughs> course, in Italian we say l'appetito bien mangiando, I mean, you get hungry the more you eat. And, and, and so, um, the only thing that I suffer is that we are not, you are not going to see it, I'm not going to see either very well, the marvelous chandeliers which are in Santiago de Compostela, which are, I mean, they cannot get in this room, they are six meters by five or something. So, and I had to go on, on a ladder, I suffered a bit from vertigo, so it was a very nice experience, but they are marvelous objects, and even the photos are not the proper photos. So it's a thing that remains for the future. I don't know, but I won't be able to do that. I'm too old, but somebody else will. And I hope to at least call the interest in people because they are something, in a way, you know, he is a sort of Frenchified Italian or an Italian who, who is really of French extraction. I mean, he, his father came to Rome around seven, in 1720, actually, 
already as a trained silversmith and an extraordinary um, smelter of roses. Yeah. Founder. Yeah. Founder. Uh, and and he, his first things are very close to that. And, and if some of the earliest things, or Luigi Valerio, so, are very, very Frenchified because he's also the son of a, of a French mother. I mean, she was a ta the daughter of a tailor. So he's both sides French, and he used to call himself Monsieur Luigi or Monsieur Louis. Uh, and sometimes some of his drawings are fully signed Louis Valadier. So in, he feels, of course, being French was then considered very chic. And, and uh, he signs himself in this way. And he went to France, though he definitely went to France. And that was not so strange, of course. He came from near Avignon. So he goes there. This is documented that he goes there. And in, in 1754, when, you, when the papal uh, administration would go and, and make the, the counting of the people, he said, Luigi absent in Paris. So this, we don't know exactly where he stayed, but that one day will be found out in the Vinité National. It, one mustn't forget that he must have been the friend of, 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 two, uh, of a great, great uh, master who worked for, in the Jesu for the, for the, um, for the pap papal monuments and works of art which were made for Saint Ignatius. So there is a real connection with all this. And he goes there he, in this chandelier, which I, of which we don't have very good photos, he must have seen in Paris the scenes by Caffieri, which were later on in Parma, and which are now in the Wallace collection, which is a sort of crime that uh, they were sold by, by, not even by the Duke of Parma, but by the first king of Italy, the two of them, and that today, and in, in, in the Wallace collection. And he must have seen these things because there were French people, he stayed there. He could not stop from seeing him. And, the, and it's one or two years after. So they almost coincide. It's a thing that I have hinted in the book, perhaps that works a little bit more of investigation. So um, you were mentioning Santiago. Um, this is what art historians do in the summer. Uh, so this is us at work on the, on the exhibition a few summers ago. But we actually traveled over these five years to, to Santiago, to Russia, to Sicily, to a whole number of places on the footsteps of Valadier. And actually Santiago was, for me, one of the more memorable trips. Um, I remember Alvar trying to convince me to borrow these chandeliers and we had no information on them whatsoever. And once we get there, we realize that they're about five meters in diameter. They're the size of one of the exhibition rooms downstairs. So that pretty much solved the issue of borrowing them. Um, but then there was really the issue of photographing them, which was almost impossible. They're, they're in the middle of the high altar of, of the cathedral, high. up high. Um, you know, if you photograph them, they disappear within the decoration of the, of the apse of the, of, the, of the cathedral. And we did climb on rather rickety ladders trying to see them in any way we could. Um, and they're amazing. I mean, they're really amazing. Three huge silver chandeliers that are there. Um, but we also went to Russia looking at objects, and um, this is a photo of Alvar at Pavlovsk. Um, what do you think were the biggest surprises for you while traveling? I mean, objects that you knew or you had seen or that... Well, seen I hadn't again. seen Pavlovsk before, and actually the amount of porphyry there, which is m not all of it is documented, but it's mounted in bronze, and uh, the Comte du Nord, uh, who, are the, the, who is the son and future Tsar of, of, of uh, Catherine the Great, uh, went to see Valadier three times. We know exactly when and, and, and what he bought. Pius VI gives him, this is interesting, uh, we should mention this, all the uh, works of Piranesi when he goes there in 1784, if I'm not wrong. And he visits and takes an amount of cases in which there is a lot of things, much of which is described. And for instance, there are two bases which are like the bases of Madame de Barry here, yeah? but these have been destroyed during the last war because keeps people's 
I keep destroying what they own, that's just not a strange thing. And these candlesticks are the second version of the ones that are here in New York, and by uh, the internal law cannot be uh, landed here. So you will have to go to see them in the Metropolitan, they are in the Reisman collection, and this is one of these decisions that cannot be broken. So uh, there is, uh, I haven't found it, but there is a photo because they were led by mistake in Rome. And it seems that they were not very happy that the law was, uh, I was very happy, of course, because that was it, it was in the early exhibition in Rome. And there is a photograph of it, which it seems did not have a very good effect here, but they had forgotten that. So this, these, a very these similar the version of these um, was yeah, done the for one. the earlier ones. Those ones yeah. come from the Palazzo Borghese. Yeah. These ones were bought by the, the, the heirs to the Russian throne, for the Sanevich, and, and they are still in Pathos. These, these, we were not very lucky with this situation because they're, the first set done for Palazzo Borghese is, is, is now at the Met. And they were destined to go over two tables, which, which are, are now at Villa Borghese, mm -hmm. one of which is here. Um, but because they were bought by Mrs. Reitzman for the Met, they cannot ever leave the Met. Of course, one of the tables and one of the candlesticks were reunited in the 97 show at Villa Medici by mistake. They, the Villa Medici asked for them without knowing about the Reitzman gift, and the Met forgot uh, they, they were Reitzman <laughs> gifts. Um, they're on the cover of the catalog. They were the poster of the exhibition. And the story is that when Mrs. Reitzman got the catalog, she was not very happy to see them on the cover and realized that they left New York. So we tried to see if, uh, uh, not a second mistake, but if this time they could be sent here on purpose and, and we didn't manage. And of course, the second versions, which were done for the, the, the son of, the, of, of, of Catherine the Great, for the future Paul the First, not bad, eh? which are pretty great as well. I think there's only a difference that I can't remember now. I think the, the Met one have four arms and the Pavlovsk ones have three, or there's slight differences like that. But they very much wanted a second set, the Russians, like the Borghese ones, and so these are made later. But of course, right now, we cannot borrow anything from Russia. There is an embargo on loans between Russia and America, so the poor table is downstairs with no candlestick. Shall we say Met something or about the photos we took there without against the law. <laughs> we did. We did take, take some photos there, which... Well, I mean, it was, it was interesting to be in Russia with, to see all these objects. Many, many of these have never been published. So, actually, I have to say, Pavlovsk, they were incredibly generous they were with very us. Nice, yes. And the curator, director there, and curators um, were wonderful. And they showed us a whole bunch of objects that no one really knew existed. I mean, we knew about the candlesticks, but there were the other porphyry yeah, vases. The other and, porphyry and, and, and yeah. they didn't even know themselves, I mean, that yeah. they must be by Valadier. There is no, I am absolutely yeah. certain about it. And when you see the amount of crates that come, uh, it, it, it wasn't only two or three objects, it was a, a, an imperial sort of commission, yeah. uh, which was gigantic. And, and, and so it's very impressive when you see this. And, and many of the things at the Hermitage as well are, are in storage. Um, most of the first set, well, all of the first set of the Belide Bogotoy, what remains of it is in storage at the Hermitage. And then the, the drawings for it are in an album at the, at the Hermitage as well, which, I mean, is, is in the drawings department, but has never been published in full no. either. But we so, did publish something. Here. Well, we have some of the images in, in the book, yeah. And some of the description also. Yeah, yeah. That we copied. And that's, that's very interesting that, you know, the book describes all the various pieces of that dessert, so we know exactly what was in it, and it's all illustrated by, by the young Giuseppe. Who's and Luigi's it's son. equally beautiful, I must yeah. say. It's, it's an incredible beautiful. volume. And it was really wonderful, actually, to be in the Department of Drawings at the, at the Hermitage, going through it and sort of seeing piece by piece and then seeing the same pieces in storage there. And also, there. you know, so thank God the people there don't retire. So there is a lady who must be about 90, Get it, I get it to her age, but she spoke not only Russian, as most of them do, but she spoke good French and a bit of Perfect Italian. Time, yeah. and, and, and so she helped us, while the young ones were nasty. And he says, you are not to photograph that. I said, it's already published in Efimova's book. You should know that, but she didn't. So they are uh, young and ignorant, so they have time to become worst. Indeed. <laughs> so. One of the things we don't really talk about in the exhibition, but obviously it's very, it's very um, thoroughly discussed in the book, is the fact that 
so much of Valadier's work is lost for a number of different reasons. Uh, natural, human causes. W what I'm showing you here is the, one of the very beautiful drawings of this incredible grill, um, made, bronze grill, made by Father Andrea Sorry. and Luigi Fadonzani. Who gets for, the money, but the, the, the father had already had a, a sort of ictus, the father. That's what I think was. And so he's paid at the end. But then there was the, uh, the earthquake in Lisbon. So I this is done for the Cathedral of Lisbon and, so and doesn't exist anymore because it's destroyed in, in the earthquake. 1751, which was one of the great natural disgraces of Europe. Even people like Voltaire and all that were terrified about it. It's uh, a, a, a national catastrophe which almost destroyed the whole city. And of course, it's grills and many other things. So what other things do you think I mean, sort of catch, you know, you, you've gone through all the payments and all the descriptions of all Valentine's well, great the, work. Most of the scenes that were in, in Roman churches are not there anymore, especially there was a treaty of Tolentino, which was 1797, and then the French imposed the, the, the pa papal state to pay for the invasion that they themselves had done in the city. So since that was considered an offense to the grandeur Francaise, they had to pay for it. And also they stole many things. And Pius VII, who was a very nice man and sort of just didn't insist in taking them. And the people who opposed most of all this was Louis de Suite, who became more uh, to the left than the leftish, which as often happens. <laughs> because this time, since we are in his favor. So, it was a, a great disaster to get the things back. And the person who was sent to do this was Antonio Canova, who was, I mean, the sort of uh, reverence that there was for him. I think only Michelangelo has had this before. And so the French were not nice, but the English were. So the English paid the Pope the money, gave him the money and the means to get the things back. Because taking these things back to Rome was an immense amount of money. So Canova, who was very gracious, went and, and became a friend of the regent, and, 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 and many of the things got back, but some of the things were destroyed forever. And, and the Pope had to give something, which were millions, Scudi, an astronomical amount of money. So all the silver in Rome, many of which, I, we don't even know exactly what they are. They, I mean, this included not only Valadier, alas, but also works of Benvenuto Cellini, documented works that we know only because of drawings. So it's one of the great disaster. That didn't happen in two places, in, in Portugal, and why the, the most beautiful Roman silver is in Portugal, what remains, or in Sicily, of which there are a number of altars, because Napoleon never got there. So he didn't, he didn't take or, the, or force the people to melt, but he was not interested in getting the thing. He wanted the money. And of course, Napoleon has many faces, and it's not only negative, he also brought a sense of liberty and a sense of, strangely enough, a sense of culture, destroying things also. But uh, that's the way things are in this world. And um, not there. So there is a lot of Roman silver still in Sicily and in Portugal. Actually, Constantinos Bulgaris' famous book, which I wish I had written, uh, um, starts saying this. I was so amazed looking at, at the treasures of Roman art, which are of Roman 18th century, which are in Lisbon that I have decided to write this book. And, and, and he was right, because the best things are there. And in Rome, there is very little. It's only a few things in bronze, and hardly any silver. There is some very beautiful bronze of Valadier, but that was not worth the same thing. So you can see them in Santa Maria Maggiore, on San Silvestro, but no silver, hardly any. any. So it's, the amount is millions of, of, of scudi in those days. So it's no, no point in crying out where it's gone, but it's gone. And, and that's it. Sometimes the drawings are useful. I have tried to use as many. There are about 2,000 drawings I have put together that come from the um, 
the, how do you say, the bottega or the, 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 the studio, the workshop of Valadier. Of course, they are not all by Valadier. They are all the things that belong to him. And uh, there was that, and there was a registro general, I mean, a, a sort of statement or document of what did the, the, the workshop contain, but this is in 1810. That is 25 years after Luigi Valadier is dead. But I mean, it has been very useful because this time I have used it also to create a list of models. Because there is another very curious thing. I think one of the great uh, capacities of Valadier is about bronze patination, which he is absolutely unbelievable, a great, great master. But the problem is that he doesn't sign, I don't know if it's because of arrogance or laziness, who knows, but he hardly ever signs a bronze. And so the result of all this is that when you find a, an unsigned piece of goodish uh, 18th century bronze, if it is unsigned, it is by Valadier. Well, that's not the word in that. But it will help the imagination of crooks. <laughs> and uh, as we know, it always happens. But we will see what happens. But the capacity of doing this is really extraordinary. So here I'm just showing some of the, um, the secular room downstairs with the silver. Because really, I mean, it took us a while and we discussed in quite some detail how to represent this aspect of Valadier's work because so much of it is gone. And so really what you're seeing is, is just the tip of the iceberg of something that, you know, there must have been hundreds, thousands of objects produced by this workshop along the lines of what you see in the exhibition, but only so little survives. You know, for many of these services, I think, you know, the great Borghese service, which was hundreds and hundreds of pieces, pieces we have yeah. four spoons and four two spoons, really sauce. Four spoons, really, four spoons. It's ridiculous. And, yeah. Not one of the great pieces remains. Some of the drawings, we have worked through the drawings. And of course, the drawings are difficult to know who they made. This is a, this is a workshop. It's not only one artist. There is one great artist and who is a father. I think we've I've tried to show you. Yeah, we have the, we have the drawings in a, in a minute. You will see them. There are a few drawings of which a man who is a great artisan. Then there are the drawings by Luigi, who is a great artist. And then there are the drawings by his son, who is a great architect. But he's not a great artist, if I see the vision. And this is, however, my vision of it, because the drawings which are signed or absolutely certain are very few, so this is perhaps my imagination. I put this as a, I mean, in art history, you have to use your imagination, otherwise you stop where you are. So, but this is not the truth. Perhaps I think it is, but I may be wrong. So, I mean, when, when it comes to the objects that have been destroyed, I mean, I, two things that always struck me were the, the dessert that is taken by Napoleon to, to Paris, the Braski one the fact that they then take the gems and the coins out to yeah. give to Josephine yeah. as a present. So and some Vivant of these Denon things... And Vivant Denon did that, yeah. was a great scholar. And, yeah, exactly, and Vivant Denon does that, not you know, as the that. director of the Louvre. He does that, and, so, and we have a list of it, but I think it's almost yeah. impossible to identify. But uh, there is a list. Of it. And then I think it's also interesting, this return to archaeology you know, within a very short amount of time. So for example, you know, Valadier, ends up transforming ancient objects into modern decoration objects. And then they're brought back to the archaeological value. So the, the one that always comes to mind is for the center of the Egyptian room at Villa Borghese, there is a beautiful granite basin, ancient basin, that Valadier sets up as a centerpiece held by these four almost life-size bronze crocodiles. And Which of course, were melted. Where, and Napoleon takes it to Paris, melts the crocodiles, and he keeps does the basin it, and in the Louvre. Thing that so. he doesn't do. Well. It's somebody who does it, not him. But uh, he was not so horrible. I mean, it's there, I but they, but it's this idea of transforming something that's decorative back but, into an archaeological piece for the But I mean, you no, know, we shouldn't compare Napoleon with Castro. Let me speak from the Cuban point of science, point of view. He was a better man. Let us put it away. Well, yes, he did bring culture, the other one didn't bring much culture. <laughs> That's true. Um, so that, this is the other room in the exhibition downstairs, the, the ecclesiastical room. And of course, the, one of the great loans to, to that room is the, sta are the statues from the altar of Monreale. Um, and this, I think, gives a very good sense of what 
altars in Rome designed by Valadier would have looked like things that don't yeah. exist anymore. And the only reason why this really exists is that it, it is in Sicily and, and clearly no one ever got there to, to melt it down and, and, and get rid of it. Um, so you can see that it has reliefs and, and, and various scenes on the you get lower parts. The, the figures on top. And the but figures on top. Let me tell you, you see them better here than in yeah. Sicily because in Sicily you have all those strange Islamic things which are not perfect for it. And so, and one doesn't see them so well, you can get so close. Alas, you don't see the, 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 the bar reliefs, but I mean, this is the first time the saints come out of Sicily. Yeah, I think they've never come out of Montreal. Yeah, and I mean, one of them is the patron of Sicily, a Santuzza, Santa Rosalia, which is the one to the right. So, I mean, that is a great sign of, uh, of diplomacy, which, which he has uh, done. And I must say, I have to, although he's not here, we have to remind Joaquin Olanza, who, who did help us a great deal. I said, you need a Sicilian prince to convince the monks to let the things out, and they hid it. And they're here, to, so one should be very grateful for that. Because, I mean, this is a miracle. They have never been to Rome, and, and they will never be, probably. So it's, it's quite extraordinary. So in a way, that is almost a miracle of Santa, of Santa Rosa Lee again. No, I, th I think it's, you know, for the next three months, people will be able to see these objects like, I mean, not even people in Montreal have ever no, seen them like that. you can't. I mean, you can't. I mean, the, the altar is very high, and I mean, we went there, and it's very difficult to and see the them in situ. And the is gone, but, because it's all, it was, it's all reconstructed in a way, in all the back, so in a way, it's not an ecclesiastical atmosphere here, but I mean, you see it. Like the things from the, the service of Cardinal Orsini, which are now in, in, in a godforsaken place in the South in Italy, Cano, yeah. where I have to admit I have never gone because it's a hell of a trip. He had to I did go, but... Well, uh, but I mean, he's younger, so that's he has the, to do that. <laughs> He'll have time to get old. That's the service that you see on the right yes. downstairs. Which is a masterpiece. And you, one learns through documents again. I always admire that object because they, the gilding is so perfect. I said, look, he obviously has never used, the, the, the cardinal was not very pious, he never <laughs> used the thing. Well, actually, we found it, not me, but somebody else found a document that says that the cardinal asked Balladier to regild, he himself, he said, to regild the thing because it has lost much of its surface. Of course, in the same documents, it came out that he had also done things for an archbishop, and this is in, in, in Catalan. Uh, there is an article in Catalan. I, I am half Spanish, but not Catalan. And it was for the archbishop, I didn't tell you that, of Leida. I said, what is Leida? Leida is the Catalan, Catalan word for Lerida. And then there are the letters of Valadier to, to a sua excellenza, archivesco di Lerida. And, and in Leida, you have to, to know the Catalan, to, and I didn't know what it was. So at the end, we found out, but of course, this was made in gold. It costed something, it doesn't exist anymore. I always have a joke. If you want something to last very little, make it in gold. If you want it to last a lot of time, put it on paper. That is very seldom destroyed. That's true. So we're talking about the drawings, and of course, there is a huge amount of Valadier drawings, Valadier, Valadier but workshops I mean, surviving. They are, and you have to start dividing. These, in my opinion, I think you agree to this, are by Andrea Valadier, and they're very early things. As you see, they, this is a sort of Louis XIV model. That, you can see, is a very early stuff. And this is probably by the father, and they coincide, I didn't want to give a lesson today, with other things which have coat of arms that go back to 1726. So since the hand is the same, I assume that this must be Andrea. There is some reason in this thing, perhaps. Then these are a different style. And this is, this is a much lighter hand. And I believe that this is a more artistic hand. But of course, he is a, he's an artist, but he's not such a great artist. And in a way, you see those put, they are not very well drawn, but they are light and, and, and very airy. So this, I believe, and the other one is very precise, is a son. This is Louis, who was born 
1726, so it's another generation. The father was born in 1894 in, 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 in Aramon, near, near in the Provence. Then the, 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 the third man is an architect, and you see he draws like an architect, very dry, very precise. He's not an artist, he's, he's, he's a technician. So, the, the, but a technician who was capable of his little poetry, and he's the author also of the Piazza del Popolo, of which you, you, you may have a photo. But as you see, this is a, it's a different hand. But, uh, and then there are many other hands, so <coughs> it's 2,000 drawings. Before we put order into that, it will take some time. Yeah, and I think for the, for the exhibition, we had a long discussion because, I mean, the Valadier workshop produced a huge amount of drawings. So it's about 100, more than 100 of them are at the Museo Napoleonico in Rome. Yeah. Um, there is an album of about in 250 in yeah. Faenza. And about, I mean, again, a few hundreds um, were with a group of dealers, the Artemis Group in London in the 1980s, 90s. Um, and those have been dismembered and keep appearing yeah, on the market. The world, yeah, but they're, they're clearly by a whole bunch of different people. So the question always is, how do you, you know, if we present a Valadier drawing, what is it? So downstairs, we were very keen on just showing things that are signed by him and that we think fit with the same hand. Um, upstairs, the drawings for the dessert are not necessarily, I don't think any of them are really by no. him, maybe one they or two. They are what we call in yeah. French, the, the sans de présentation. They are done by somebody who is very precise, but not with a great soul. They are very, uh, they give a big impression, but they have not a great depth. Yeah. But they are big things, perfectly finished, and exquisite as far as the rendering goes. But to me, there is no vibration. There is another thing. But these are personal opinions. No, and I think, you know, the reason we decide, and this is the very first time, actually, ever that the dessert is shown with the drawings. And the idea of showing them together is just that the drawings represent parts of the dessert that are missing. Little statuettes, little vases, little no, things they, well, that they have gone missing. So. And, the, and the little holes are still there. Yeah. So they did exist. It's not an invention. Yeah. And then, you know, new discoveries. So, you know, as we were working on the show, um, many objects, I would say there's about seven, eight objects in the show that came out doing the research on the show, things that no one has really seen before. And even after that, I found two, three things more. So this but is this one of the... this always happens. I hope one of you is going to own one of these things and tell me one day. But uh, these are, I should have seen them before, and I didn't. They are in the Vatican Museum, where I have passed 300 times, in the Museo Profano. And there was something I should have Notice, I mean, the vases are repeated in some clocks of the time of the father. But it took me away because the central part, uh, after a series of bas reliefs by Delaporte, which go back to the 16th century, but they are not the original things. They are in silver, and the proportions are not identical. The other ones are more oval. And I have a bunch of documents, but I didn't have the time yet to go and read of the works that Luigi and his son did for Pius VI at the very end of, 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 uh, of the life of Luigi, and the Dargo, which he stops by suicide in 1785, and go on till Pius VI is sent away by the French in 1798. So that is the documentation of what they did for the Pope, as, as also as, not only as Pope, but also as, as a person. I mean, they did his glasses all the time, mounted in, in a thing that is forbidden to go to America now, tortoise shell, and things like that, but it had the paper blessing in those days. And uh, I mean, this probably is the big sound then at the time, so but to them it's a different consideration. Anyway, <laughs> it so happens that I thought that there was something that looked like him, till I found a drawing for it which is a document, not a written document, but as you see, this is the first idea. And that is a second version of the thing for a clock, which looks like a clock guided by some sphinxes on a bicycle or something of the sort, very funny. But if you go back to it, you will see that that is the idea for this. And 
that these things are probably copies of the original ovals by mm, De La Porta, but in silver, which he never did, and with the proportions not so oval as they are in the original. So I think this, this one made by Valadier himself, because he did that for the Pope. He changed it, adjusted things. There is a small, in one of the cameos here, one, I always forget one is, but I mean, if one goes back and look at it, one can say, one of the little goats on top is ancient, or more or less ancient, and the other one is made by him. So he was capable of copying things that were in the, in the, in the Vatican collections and rearrange it and use them in other means. However, they're, I think, astonishingly beautiful objects, which I hope to publish soon in the proper way. But I still haven't found the original document for it. So one of the things you, you already mentioned is the bronzes. And, and we decided to have a vitrine of bronzes in the Oval Room with five. And then actually, there is another one on the opposite wall um, from either the National Museum in Stockholm or the Royal Palace in Stockholm. They were all part of a series of bronzes commissioned by Gustav III of Sweden, which are now split for you know, undocumented. Sort of, yeah, I mean, in the yeah. sense we know he bought them there, there is a permit of exportation, which in, in is uh, where the license is asked and signed by Canova, who was the person who had to do it in those days. And so they're absolutely certain they are where they should be, but they are not signed. While oh, every single Rigetti bronze is signed, and even of the only, only other more modest Roman founders is signed, but he never did, except for the big, big bronzes in the Louvre, which was one meter, one meter and 80, which is a dozy sign. But the ones made for Madame du Barry, which are in the Louvre, are not signed. They are perfectly documented, too. So that, why didn't he do it? I have no answer for that. And here there's a selection of some of these. This is one in the show. This is another one. That this is one of the things that one discovers through reading the documents. The, this is um, in, in the list of the, um, of the Registro Generale, which you bought recently ago, but which I have used since 1991 when it was found. Uh, this is mentioned. The, the fauna of the, the, the Villa Albani. And there is one which corresponds to the, well, this is the first one that appeared that I knew which was with Tommaso Brothers, and then came, I don't know, to, to some dealer, to some collector here in Rome. There is a second version of it, which is in the, even more beautiful, which is in Amsterdam, who are equally beautiful, marvelous pattern. And a third one, which I have never seen, the Royal Collection. I don't know where, but those exist. There are three versions of it. But there is a list of about 70, As they are not signed, it's not going to be right? unless there is a provenance. So it's a long work to, to be done. And what is amazing also is that he's not just copying antiquities, as far as we know, but he's also copying model, modern contemporary yeah. works for, from his time. So this is the copy of the Ebe by, by Canova. Which is listed in the register. And, and you can see that the quality is extraordinary. This belonged to Andrew Shikanoviecki of my gallery years ago. But as you see, the, the quality is, is, of course, it's, uh, this is Giuseppe. You see, this is a complicated thing. When uh, Luigi kills himself, uh, the thing has to go on. And, and, uh, and the son, who wanted to be an architect, for a number of years did silver and arranged mountain scenes for the Pope and did also found, he did a series of, the, of 20 life-size statues, of the greatest statues of antiquity, but it, one doesn't know even what the subject is, for the time being. Things later on, later on would be found one time, I'm sure. But it's going to be difficult to edit. So there is a lot of work to do, I mean, still. I mean, talking of bronze, the, one of the most beautiful objects that Valadier produces, and actually one of the most beautiful objects in the show, is the Borghese. Her. Um, how, how do you respond to this object? What, what do you think about it? I mean, it's such an extraordinary thing. Well, I, I liked it so much that I, I did all the best I could to, to, to find it. I did, because Faldi was 
in his very good catalog, got almost near to it, but I mean it's not signed. And, and unless you know, uh, it's difficult to think. The, the fragments, uh, which is a very rare type of alabaster, called alabaster rosa, the first part, the top, top part, is one piece, and then somebody else sold another piece to make this, because it's a very rare stone to find. And then I found a note in Canova's diary where he says, I went to see a, a beautiful thing in Balladier's studio, and the head has been made by a strange Polish good sculptor who's now in uh, Pietroburg, in Peterburg. And so then, but he, he, this man is André Lebrun, who is a strange man, has nothing to do with Madame Lebrun, or with the other great painter of the 17th century. But we know all about him. As a matter of fact, he worked for Catherine the Great and for Poniatowski in Poland. And there is, in the, in, in, here in New York, in the Gallery of Statues in the Department of Sculpture, there is a sign, there is a sign Boston of a cardinal by him. He has been forgotten, but he's, you, well, Nos is the only man who, who, who is a Polish man who goes to Rome. So it's this man we know now who made this. And of course, he made a model of this thing. And then it's one of the best bronzes of Valadier. If you, he, he describes in the, in, the, in the bill that he says that he did a very special patination, and you can see it up at the top here, where I put some pezzetti d'or, or pieces of gold, to make it shine and look like an antique. But he's not making a fake, he's working for the Pope. He just thinks it's a poetical vision of how things should look the way they were. So they think they know how to do it better, and in a way they did, and, it, and it's a masterpiece. And, I'm, and, and you loved it as much as I did. It's yeah. an incredible thing. And it was, it, but since it was anonymous, nobody looked at it. And I think the other incredible objects are obviously the, the cameos that you referred to as well, the two um, ex Carpegna sort of groups of cameos that are then mounted for the Pope and are also now in the Louvre. Yeah. Um, I think these are just extraordinary, the, the, the invention of putting all these things together in, 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 in these sort of displays. Well, in the first place, they are masterpieces as far as the ancient part is. Yeah. But they're inventing all these with pieces of other things, all the, the fishes there, they're all ancient. So, and you, you have a favorite there too. Yeah, I love the, the left corner of the one on the left has a little ancient dog chasing an Egyptian scarab. I mean, you'll see it in the, in the, in the room, you can see it much better, it's a fabulous thing. Uh, but they're, they're very witty objects. I mean, they're, they're you know, deeply serious and, and clearly concerned with archeology, span but at the same time, they're meant to be decorative and, and you know, they're meant to be beautiful. And, and I think they're meant to be you know, looked at and, and the, the, you have to sort of notice all the details. And these were kept in cupboards at the Vatican. So there is a day that you open the cupboard, also designed by Valadier, and, and then you, you, you admire these sort of objects from antiquity set in these, in these extraordinary settings. And the cameras themselves are considered by the archaeologists great masterpiece. This one is in glass. It's like the Portland vase in the British Museum, which belonged to the Barberini and then to, to another dealer, who can't remember the name now, but it will come to me, who sold it to the British, to the Duchess of Portland, who only owned it for a year. And she, it has kept her name, these funny things that happened. And this other one is a, a, can, a cameo with various depths. It's all, it's all made of one stone, carving in. But that's not Valadier. He just used them and mounted them and getting all that he wanted from the, from, the, from the Vatican collection, he mounted it in this extravagant well. Now, one of these little goats is a good one. I think the one to the left. And the other one he made himself. It's not, it's not so easy to identify. He was a great, capable uh, artisan as far as craftsman as far as inventing things. And then it, using the whole thing, it's all made with little cameos. And uh, this, for instance, is a zafirane, which is a thing clap that you put on the toga. And it's a perfect thing, which is, it's really of invaluable beauty. And, and, 
but one has to be a little bit depraved to, <laughs> to use this in this way. Then using at the same time some strange stones, like the one to the, to the right, which is a sort of alabaster who looks like a, like a chewing gum. And it, it, it's rather amusing. And it's a, a type of alabaster called alabasto d'orta, which, which didn't, wasn't used by the ancients. So it's, he has these innovations of looking at stones and considering them from a sort of painterly point of view. I mean, I think his it's, it's, it's sensibility to, to materials is astonishing, and I think that is clearly most obvious in, in the De Sales. You know, the idea that he's using different marbles, stones, semi-precious stones, Also, to say, not comparisons and, to the other people who yeah. made that. I mean, it's, it's really, his son does things, but they are not on the same level. The one, the son goes and works with Albacini to the other one that I like very much also, which is in Vienna. But it's a bit monochord. I mean, he also uses one type of style. So that he is a much, he's much more an artist. I mean, it's sort of, uh, and I think the comparison that you make in, in the book, obviously, is a comparison also with Piranesi. Because mm -hmm. the two, I mean, overlap. They're not exact contemporaries, but they, they overlap. I mean, Valadier starts his career as Winkelmann is dying, but Piranesi is there already. It's, and it's, it's, I mean, they, they must have known each other. And one doesn't think, but I mean, there is something in common. And it's an invention of antiquity which has nothing to do with reality. It's just a, a vision of it, so to say. And, uh, but let's say, before Piranesi, we looked at Rome in another way. <laughs> and, and if you look at this man, you can, in a way, imagine what the use of color was or may have been in antiquity, which we don't really know, if one thinks that all the statues were painted in bright colors. So it's, in a way, one lives on, on, with the eyes of Canova for the people. And, but he's a, an inventor in a way. That's why I call him a genius. And the other are, are very good, but they are not geniuses. They are of another thing. Yeah, and I think it goes full circle because you know, the way that Valadier is being inspired by, by you know, archaeology and architecture and shrinking it in a way to, to a table setting then gets blown up again by his son, who does become an architect. And so the comparison here is between the Dessert and the Piazza del Popolo in Rome, which is designed by Giuseppe Valadier, the son. But when you start thinking of it as a, as a, as a giant Dessert, you realize that actually that's exactly the idea, the Egyptian lions, the obelisk, the fountains on the sides. And I mean, you don't see it in this photo, it's a very difficult space to photograph, but you have rostral columns. Um, you actually see the edge of one here with the ships sticking yeah. out, and then there are rostral columns on the sides of the dessert in the show. So very similar elements appear in both. And of course, the lions are sort of versions, more or less, of the Egyptian lions that hold the dessert at the bottom. So it, it sort of goes full circle, the sort of idea of shrinking architecture and then re-expanding it through this, this experiment in a way in the 1770s, 1780s, and then into the 19th century where the square becomes a, a sort of neoclassical early 19th century space for Rome. So I think we reached the end of our conversation. Um, I'd like to remind you all that the exhibition is open both downstairs and upstairs for another half hour. And I welcome you all to see it if you haven't seen it before. And both of us will be around, so if you have any questions for us afterwards, please feel free to come up and ask any questions. Thank you. <laughs>